Jeremiah 31 and 3. See, I want to speak to you just a little bit on what happened on this day and this coming week 2,000 years ago in Psalms. And it may not be a shout me down sermon, and that's okay. But I pray it's a listen with a heart sermon that you might be reminded of the purpose of this week of passion. It's so important for us. Jeremiah 31 and 3. The Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. That's enough to preach on for a lifetime. That's enough to preach on for the next couple of years to speak of how God has loved us and how with such unending kindness he has drawn us close to him. First John chapter 3. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. It's almost with bewilderment, amazement that the apostle writes these words. See what great love, as if he's trying to convince his listeners, hey, take a look. Don't gloss over this truth. Look at the, the, the thickness and the beauty and the grandness of this love. And furthermore, the audacity to be called children of God. Hmm. And that is what we are. When I think of this passage in my own personal way and knowing my past life, I can see the amazement with which the apostle speaks these words. Look at this love. What manner of love, some translations write. What manner of love is this, that you and I, born in sin, live disobedience lives, were sure and worthy of our destiny in a Christless eternity, a people who even today sit in these pews, and still rub shoulders with things that break his heart. Ah, that was a good place to say amen. We still rub with junk in this world. Not me, Pastor. Well, you must be stronger than Paul because Paul wrestled with that in his life. He said, the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, those things I do. And he screamed out with great despair, who will save me from this body of death? And so today we rub against these negative things. Yet, because of the manner of his love, we are called children of the Most High. And if he puts a period on this statement, he says, if there's any question, that is what we are. Don't ever let the devil argue with you. Don't ever let anyone accuse you otherwise. When they say, oh, you're a child of God, you never answer, well, I'm hoping to be. Well, I hope at the end of this journey, he counts me to be. No, the Bible says that's what you are. <laughs> Hallelujah. I may rub shoulders with the wrong thing sometimes, but I remember that little Christian nursery rhyme. He's still working on me. Come on, somebody. Some of us need a little bit more work than others. <laughs> How many need a little bit more work than others? And the rest of you need a little work on your pride. I said, how many of us need a little bit more work than our brother? There you go. God's working already. Hallelujah. 
we haven't got it together. Paul said, the things that I don't want to do, I do. In other scripture, he voiced out saying, listen, I haven't arrived where I need to be. I'm not all I need to be right now, but I keep pressing on, forgetting all the junk I've been in and the things I rub against, and I press on toward the goal I have in Christ. He didn't say it that way. He's not from Edinburgh. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about, yes? Yeah. What manner of love. Hmm. When you think of your sinfulness, or at least when I think of mine, I say, wow, man, he must really love me. He must really care for me to call me his son and to seal it and say, that's what I am. This is Palm Sunday, and today marks off the week of the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is to some known as the day of triumphal entry. For some of us, we know it as Palm Sunday. This is when Jesus made his way into Jerusalem. It was an intense time when he arrived into that city that day. By that time, all the Jewish religious people had made their way into the city. They were Thousands and possibly millions of people in that place. Flooded was that place. And they were there all in celebration of the Passover. And all of a sudden, down the road, they see this humble donkey and this Jewish Messiah sitting upon it. And they had recognized him because they had seen things he had done. They knew who he was. And those who had come to believe in him took branches, the Bible says, of palms. And they laid it on the road that he might walk upon them as Hollywood does today in their trashy red carpet. But those palms were laid down that righteous might walk on it. And the Bible tells us that the people joyfully begin to shout praises unto God. Oh, Santa! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They waved their palm branches and cheered King Jesus on. And as people were celebrating, Jesus knew that this festive moment was not going to end up festive like most people assumed. For this was his last day of public approval. This was the last day that people will agree with him. This is the last time that such a cry would come together in the masses to reveal an attitude of acceptance to this well-known Messiah. There were all kinds of people by the road when I preached sermons on the types of people that went out to see Jesus, but you know that there were those who truly loved him and went to worship him. There were those agnostics that were proud in their hearts and wanted to see what this whole show was about. Others were there with malice in their hearts trying to find some fault in him. So when after this whole charade was over, they might accuse him. All kinds of people. Kind of like today. Kind of like today in our gatherings sometimes. Or when you go out to a park and preach, you have all kinds of people show up. Some go there to worship Jesus. Others go there because they like the music. Others go there because they want to criticize Christians and what they do. And so it was on that road this day. But others went because they also saw miracles from the hands of Christ. They had seen cripples and walking and the mute talking and the deaf hearing and the lepers clean. They had even seen the dead rise at the command of this Christ. They had found true hope in him because of what they had seen him do. For others, Jesus gave them a second chance. A promise of hope. 
But there were others who were there to meet him expecting something else. You see, there were some political gatherings there at that place too. People that were there for self-interest. They were hoping to find some kind of great powerful ruler that would come to deliver the people from the grips of the Roman government. But Jesus didn't ride in on some beautiful Clydesdale stallion robed in white and royal purple with a 30-pound sword at his waist and a 30-pound shield at his arm. It was a humble entrance that he made. And they cheered all the day long. And those of you who know the story know that this week that began with great celebration on this day 2,000 years ago, all the cheers and praises led him all the way up to a hill called Calvary where he gave his life to die for all of us. While Jesus indeed deserved a triumphal entry as king, Luke emphasizes in this gospel that instead of moving forward towards praises, he was seen moving instead toward that place of his final rejection. Eventually the applause and quickly the mood changes. And this reveals a lot about the hearts of the people that were there. They cheered over joy. Many of them did because they thought they would receive from Jesus everything they wanted. They were there to glean Christ for every miracle they could get only at the end to throw him aside and forget him. And in this case, even crucify him. Just like today. Isn't it amazing that it's when people find themselves in dire straits that all of a sudden Jesus becomes the Messiah. Am I talking too slow? Can you understand my English? See, it revealed... But it happens a lot today that when people find themselves in dire straits, all of a sudden Jesus has risen and is full of power. And so the altars are full of people sometimes screaming out to God, Oh, Santa, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And instead of raising worshiping hands, they raised palms to see what they can receive for that moment. While they were in that place in Jerusalem that day waving palms from palm trees today, people come only when things are difficult, waving palms to see gimme. Man, I'm liking this sermon already. It's Napoleon who wrote... In one of his journals, traveling through Switzerland with his army, he was greeted with the thunders of applause and enthusiasm as he rode into town. And there was a nearby supporter that he pulled over and called over to him. And he said this. He said, this unthinking crowd under a slight change of circumstances will follow me even more eagerly to the gallows. In other words, the very same people that say, Oh, Santa, were shouting out by the end of the week, crucify him, let his blood be on our head. Just like today. What a tragedy for Christ this week. What a powerful time it must have been in his life. What pain, insult, sorrow he must have felt. You see, he was human to feel this thing. Some people would make him like he was immune to feeling anything negative. Like, oh, he's God. He's not going to feel rejection. He's not going to feel 
the pulling of his beard. He's not going to feel the striking with the whip. But oh, he did everything feel. What a tragedy he must have felt in his heart. What a betrayal must have flooded his soul. Just a week before his suffering began, he invited some of his friends to go out and pray. And he was, he hadn't even entered Jerusalem that moment. And he was already experiencing the denial of the world in his heart. And he writes in Matthew 26 and 36. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there to pray. And he took Peter and his two sons Zebedee along with him. And he began to be sorrowful. Or should I say sorrow filled and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here. And keep watch with me. Have you ever been so sorrow, filled with sorrow and sad that you just sometimes need someone to stay guard with you? That was Christ. And you know the details of the coming week 2,000 years ago. You know that it was really no celebration that Jesus had that day. But it led to his crucifixion. And there true innocence died on a sinful cross. What moved Jesus to Jerusalem? What kept him going? Why do we have trouble continuing in God sometimes? Why do we sometimes profess, well, you know, I'm kind of disappointed today. I don't know. I don't feel like going to church. I don't know. I used to pray a lot, but I don't. I used to read the word of God, but I don't anymore. I used to witness. I don't like to go with the team anymore. What is it that keeps us on that seesaw thing with Christ? You're on today. You're off tomorrow. We never saw that in Christ in his walk all the way up the hill called Golgotha. We never saw that him. We never saw him waver as he laid down. And they pierced his hands and his ankles with nails. We never saw that in him, any kind of wavering as they whipped him, as they pulled his skin from his body, as they spit on him, as they stripped him naked to, to play and gamble with his clothes. The insults never saw him waver. But what was it that kept him going? If truly, indeed, he was all human, then we must understand the element. We all know that when he was taken to the cross, he did not put up a fight. He didn't flee at the news of the arriving guard that came to take him prisoner. He did not fire or run off Judas when he found out that one of his best friends was going to betray him. But he came into town accepting the next seven days of his life with a big godly embrace. How did he do that? What made him never lose focus? I'm going to tell you what it is. Love. Love. Passion. Passion, by definition, implies a strong emotion that has an overpowering or compelling effect. It implies an emotion of burning intensity or fervor, suggesting a constant glow or feeling. What kept Jesus going all the way up to that cross was the fact that he loved you. The fact that he loved me. The fact that John 3.16 tells us how vast and what manner of love Christ had. That he loved the whole world. God did. An insatiable, 
unscratchable, unremovable love does God have for us all. In the face of those who falsely accused him, he didn't budge. In the face of those who publicly ridiculed him, he didn't budge. In the face of those who physically abused him, he didn't budge. And those who openly crucified him before the eyes of the world, you never saw him shrink back into destruction. He stood the course. That's what God is expecting of all of us. To stay the course. To stay on fire. To continue on a daily basis. Stop being a seesaw Christian. Or as I call them sometimes a Christmas tree light Christian. Hard to guess where you're at sometimes when we don't see you for a while. But God wants you full of fire all the time. And the only way, ladies and gentlemen, that we're going to continue is to fall in love with him. I heard a man once say, if you're able to walk away from God, you never knew God. If you're able to walk away from the Lord, you never knew him. If you're able to walk away from what you called salvation, you were never saved. Because it is impossible to come to Christ and not be changed. The Bible teaches that therefore anyone in Christ becomes a new creation. It's impossible to remain the same. There was no way when I came to Christ that I would get up from the altar after having accepted him to walk away in my sinful way. To know Christ is to be changed by Christ. Jesus never in any way wavered because he loved us. And there were reasons behind it. Can I give you some quick ones before we close? The first and primary, and this will always be first in any sermon, any preacher here preaches from this pulpit. The reason Jesus died for us is because he died to spare us and save us from our sin. That always has to be one of the principles. It may sound cliche or monotonous to some of us. Oh, it's the same principle. This is the third principle or the first or the last. It doesn't matter. That principle should never be ignored. Jesus came to forgive us of all of our sins. Hallelujah. He came to set us free. He came to live amongst us to die on the cross. Because he could not shake himself from the uncontrollable desire to see you and I forgiven of everything we were guilty of. The Bible says that one day Jesus approached Jerusalem upon a hill and he looked at them in the life they were living. And the only thing he could do at that moment was weep. And he cried out the very popular words that all of you might know or should know. He said, oh, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets, you who deny God's word, you who won't go to church, you who won't listen to what the gospel says. Oh, my God. If only you knew the time of my visitation. If you only understood what I want to do in your life, how I want to change you. You had only known on this day what would bring you peace. You would have acknowledged him. What a powerful picture to see Christ. Dying on the cross for the purpose of giving you and I life. Giving us forgiveness. Have you received that forgiveness of the Lord? 
Have you been forgiven? You see, some of us, sadly enough, we live in this condemning state, not only not receiving Christ, but we don't forgive ourselves as well. And you live a life filled, of, filled with guilt. Let me tell you, Christ came to destroy even that. Come on, somebody. He came to destroy. And he did it by laying down his life, as we find in John 10 and 11. He is the good shepherd that lays down his life for the sheep. The second thing that Jesus came to die on, filled with love, was to give us a new beginning. Give us an, a reason and a purpose for life. Can I get a witness this morning when I say that all of us need new beginnings? And the reason you want a new beginning is because the life behind you was full of mess-ups. Can I get an honest Christian in this house and say, I was a mess up, Lord. I needed someone to erase the canvas and give me an opportunity. Thank God for second chances. In some cases, thank God for third and fourth and fifth chances. He's a God of grace. The Bible says he desires that no one perish. And therefore, his grace Last from everlasting to everlasting. But he comes to set us free. He comes to forgive us. To forget our yesterday. To make us new creations and give us new beginnings. It was in Ezekiel that the prophet voiced these words in Ezekiel 36 verse 26. He said, I will give you a new heart. Put a new spirit in you, and I will remove from you a heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you, move you to follow my decrees, and be careful to keep my laws. New beginnings. Where will we be without new beginnings? Jesus died on that day because he knew that all of us would need a new start. Galatians 6 says, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord. Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world, and neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is what? What counts is what? A new creation. We've been born again. We have a new lease on life. We have a new life altogether. Thirdly, I'll move quickly this morning. He came to give us peace and comfort. You know, this world is full of letdowns, ladies and gentlemen, just in case you hadn't noticed. This world is filled with broken dreams, unsatisfied feeling, bitterness, and betrayal. And if you need proof of that, you'll find out that here in America, we are the most medicated people in the world. We are the most medicated people in the world. We are the worst drug addicts in the world. We worry about the cartels bringing all kinds of stuff inside. We're already taking stuff at home. And the majority of the drugs that we take are all antidepressants. They're things to help us sleep. Things to calm our nerves. Things to make us feel better because we're oppressed or depressed. Should we ignore today the gift of God that he bought for us on that cross? And that is the gift of peace and rest and comfort. You see, you can find rest for your souls. You can find peace for your hearts if you'll come to Jesus this is why Jesus wept when he looked upon Jerusalem saying, if only you had only known this day and what would bring you peace, if you had known me, I will satisfy your heart. I don't know where you're at this morning and maybe you're struggling with stuff in your life that have you antsy all the time. I know people that are antsy all the time. 
You say, relax. At night, our eyes are open, staring at a dark ceiling until morning. We're exhausted. I've experienced those things. But should we continue experiencing all those things knowing that we have a God of peace that can give us rest, comfort? Jesus said, peace I live with you. My peace I give you, not give to you as the world gives you. You see, getting all the money in the world won't buy you peace. Having the job you've been praying for will probably bring you more concern. Getting the car you get doesn't bring you peace. It'll give you a bigger payment. Buying that million-dollar home you want is going to make you feel comfortable for 29 days. Because <laughs> the mortgage comes on the first See, we try to find peace in different things. Some of young girls want to find peace by finding a good-looking boyfriend. Don't do it. Don't do it. We're trouble. Finish college. Find peace in yourself first. Find peace in yourself first, and then you'll be able to offer peace to somebody else. The peace that this world offers us is temporary, only for a moment, only for a season, only when things are calm. Everybody is happy when everything is calm. Oh, but once you hear that gas is going to $7 a gallon... Where are you going? I'm going to the store. Well, can't you walk? <laughs> People getting anxiety all the time because we see that this world doesn't offer anything like the peace that your Savior can give you. <laughs> Isaiah 54, verse 10, Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, Yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed. Whenever you're going through an anxious time, say, Lord, you said your covenant of peace would not be removed. Give me your peace in my heart now. Let me know that you walk alongside me like a mighty warrior. And finally, this morning, he died to give you a victory crown. He died to give you victory over this world that we live in today. The Bible tells us that in the beginning, God created the garden. God provided this garden. This garden was perfect without lack, lack of imperfections. But then we fell just to move ahead. You know the story or you've seen some movie. Isn't that amazing that some people don't read the Bible with the great to see Charlton Heston in the Ten Commandments to understand the story. But we needed nothing until we fell in transgression against the Lord from that garden. And the Lord's been trying to give us victory again. You see, you, no one can thwart the plans of God. Jesus said this. He said, it is my Father's desire that none be lost. You know what that tells me? That the devil is sure in trouble at the end of the age. There's going to be a fight for souls in these last days. Because it's my father's desire, Jesus said, that none be lost. And I tell you what, if the Lord desires souls not to be lost, those hanging on to those souls better watch their fingers and their wrists because they're going to be broken. We need to continue praying for our children. We need to be praying for our husbands. We need to be praying for our family members. 
We're going to get to the point where God is going to step in if we pray. And God is going to begin to deliver our family members. Our children are going to be on fire for God on this altar. They're going to be seeing dreams and seeing visions. They're going to be prophesying in the name of Jesus. Why? Because it's the desire of the Father that none be lost. He promised us victory. He promised us victory. It was a song of Solomon who said, The horse is made ready for the day of battle, but victory rests with the Lord. Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. Oh, some of you don't even know that song. But I'm telling you, He came to give us victory. Do you need victory this morning? The Bible said that 2,000 years ago, Jesus sent his son. And he sent him with a message. He said, it is my father's joy to give you the keys to heaven. It is my father's great desire to give you the inheritance. And on this day, 2,000 plus years ago, Jesus began that journey to fulfill his purpose. What he's waiting for now, listen carefully, is for you to accept the labor of his love. It's for you to accept what he has done for you. This whole week of passion, take time to read the Bible. Take time to read what he went through for you. All with the purpose of providing you these things I've mentioned and many more. What he's waiting for now is to have a triumphal entry in your heart. We sang that last song. I, it came to my heart when I was back there playing my guitar. and The worship team was going at it. and It was just so beautiful. And my heart began to well and spirit began to bubble and I didn't know who to tell. The music was so loud that I had to turn on my boy and, and say, tell DJ because he's got this communicator. I said, tell DJ to sing I will make room for you. I said, tell him to sing I will make room for you. Jesus be, DJ began to sing that song and you understood that song. And it blessed my heart. Ladies and gentlemen, this morning, this whole Palm Sunday is about us making room for Him. It's about making room for Him, accepting the things He has done for us. He died to save us. And beautifully and wonderfully, He died to forgive us. I wake up sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, in the middle of the night, thinking and remembering I'm a 63-year-old man and I've lived a life, but I wasn't always saved, as many of you would assume. And the guilt of my yesterday, sometimes the devil tries to flood me over and crushes me, and I wake up and I begin to pray. And I began to call out to God, but then the Spirit of the Lord reminds me, remember Calvary. Remember Calvary. This day, 2,000 years ago, Calvary became significant to the world. Never had a cross been paid attention to. There were a lot of crosses in Jerusalem. There were a lot of crucifixions. Prisoners were always punished that way. Oh, but it wasn't the cross that was significant that day. It was the one who came and gave his life on that cross. It brought value to that piece of wood. That cross would never be the same. That cross came with a promise. It brought unto us 
and it reached to heaven, giving us a stairway to be able to reach the Father. We could not reach the Father unless we stood in the arms of that cross. He died to save you. He died to forgive you. He died to give you peace. He died to give you hope. He died to bring you healing. And he died to give you victory. I want that.